The coelacanth is the evolutionist's dirty little secret. Thinking it to be extinct for 66 million years and in their hunt for the elusive transitional species between fish and amphibians, these supposed scientists couldn't wait to jump on what is clearly a fish with no hint of ever walking on land. What they didn't expect is that this species would be found still living today, completely unchanged. If evolution is true, why do we see no coelacanths in layers since the time of the dinosaurs? If evolution is true, why haven't these creatures evolved since then? More importantly, why haven't evolutionists publicly admitted they were wrong? I had to investigate. Although there had been several coelacanth specimens uncovered before, it wasn't until 1839 that they received a name and classification by creationist biologist and geologist Louis Agassiz. It is often claimed that the name refers to the animal's hollow spine, but in reality the name referred to the hollow rod-like rays in its dorsal fins. Since then, over 120 individual species have been identified. Of those specimens, none of them were extracted from strata any younger than 66 million years. Due to this, paleontologists concluded that as far as anyone could tell, the coelacanth was extinct. On December 23, 1938, Captain Hendrik Goosen caught a strange fish off the east coast of South Africa and brought it to his local market where the museum curator, Marjorie Courtney Latimer, discovered it. Not recognizing the fish and noticing that its fins resembled limbs, she wrote a letter including a drawing to South African ichthyologists organic chemist, and Rhodes University professor James Leonard Brierly Smith. Smith confirmed the fish's importance and in her honor eventually dubbed the species Latimeria chelumni. At the time of this discovery, scientists were reasonably certain that land tetrapods and lobe-finned fishes shared a most recent common ancestor that lived geologically just prior to the tetrapod adaptation to land. The theory was that the tetrapod limb was a repurposed lobe fin, which, in turn, was a repurposed ray fin. At the time, there was no way to test this theory, but in 1996, a French team led by Catherine Romain published a paper in the journal Development which documented their experiments with mouse genes. They discovered that switching off the Hox A13 and Hox D13 genes prevented the development of limbs from the ankle down, implying that the Hox genes were responsible for the development of digits. In 2013, postdoctoral researchers Tetsuya Nakamura inserted random DNA into the analogous hox genes in zebrafish. This insertion caused a frame shift and thereby jumbled up the genes. The result was that these ray fin fishes developed fins without rays. Graduate student Andrew R. Gerke also conducted a parallel experiment engineering the zebrafish to emit a glow from every protein catalyzed by the two hox genes. When compared to the appendages in mice using the same technique, Gerke noticed that the hox gene is responsible for both digits and rays. This was published in the August 17, 2016 issue of the journal Nature. Back in 1938, however, scientists were aware that the coelacanth is indeed a lobe-finned fish, but it was never considered to be representative of our fish-like ancestor until Smith examined the specimen. The only other still-living order of lobe-finned fish were the ceridontiform lungfish. These six species all share the ability to breathe air through a lung adapted from a modified swim bladder, but they are also noted for having fleshy, bony fins used to push themselves along rivers, lake beds, and swamps, and across small stretches of land. The coelacanth specimen certainly possessed the most limb-like fins ever seen, but there was no way for Smith to know if the specimen possessed lungs because the viscera had spoiled and been disposed of before he could make the trip to examine the find. Smith was eager to make his mark as a scientist and went to great lengths to publicize the species as a potential analog for our pre-tetrapod ancestor. As a whole, the rest of the scientific community was silent on the matter. This silence was justified over the next several decades after more and more coelacanth individuals were caught. Upon examination, the modern coelacanth possesses a fatty reservoir which is homologous to a lung but also to a swim bladder. On October 28, 2000, a diving team led by Peter Tim encountered the first ever coelacanth in its natural habitat. As it turned out, the coelacanth does not use its fins to navigate along the seafloor. Their primary purpose is to propel the fish, almost like a helicopter, in any direction no matter what direction it's facing. In 2013, Chris Amamiya and 
and Neil Shubin published a paper in the journal Nature detailing the genome sequence of the coelacanth. Comparing the genomes of both coelacanths and lungfish to the human genome, there was just a little more genetic relationship between lungfish and humans than coelacanths and humans, meaning genetically the coelacanth was related to land vertebrates but not as closely as lungfish. There has been speculation that the ancestors of modern coelacanths once had an air-breathing lung and they may have initially adapted their lobed fins for navigating on the seafloor along coastlines. While that is a possibility, it is impossible to determine which species of coelacanth is the ancestor of today's coelacanths. Just like the horseshoe crab, the coelacanth is not a species. The coelacanth is actually a taxonomic order containing over 120 species within 20 genera across five taxonomic families. Each species is noted for its distinct anatomical features, whether it be the shape and proportions of limbs, the shape and proportions of the body, or any other morphological anomaly. Of the two species living today, neither of them is seen in the fossil record. As of this video's upload date, no fossilized species of coelacanth has ever been found, which is any larger than a foot. Modern species, however, grow to be nearly two meters long. We know that these small fossilized coelacanths aren't juveniles for at least two reasons. The first is that modern coelacanth eggs are almost twice the size of the largest fossilized specimen. The second is that the morphology of juvenile coelacanths is markedly different than that of adults. Every fossil coelacanth ever found has had adult morphology. As I said in the last episode, when an organism is well adapted to its ecology, it has no environmental pressure to change its morphology. The modern coelacanth is a deep sea dweller and the top of the food chain where it lives. The common trend amongst apex predators is that they tend to grow larger. Since the fossilized coelacanths are all found in deposits formed in shallow coastal waters, it's very likely that the transition from coastal to deep sea life is what triggered such a massive increase in size and explains why we haven't found more recent fossils. The creationist claims about coelacanths have a grain of truth to them. Yes, a scientist once staked his own reputation on the possibility that the coelacanth was an ancestor to all land vertebrates, but the scientific community and mass never embraced that claim. Yes, if you look closely at a fossil coelacanth while standing across the room from a modern coelacanth, they might resemble each other a little bit. But the same could also be said of the fossilized coelacanth compared to a modern lungfish. Wherever the coelacanth fits into the vertebrate family tree, they are fascinating creatures and another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.